Welcome. Brian, thank you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Welcome to Soccer House. Yeah, thanks for having, <laughs> a, having me, at yeah. least. Uh, um, so, thanks for taking some time and joining us to answer some questions that we've accumulated based on uh, our member survey, some calls with our chapter leaders. We really appreciate your time and uh, uh, being here. No, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we, we like these opportunities to get closer to uh, our fans and, and, and members and having an opportunity to talk to you and to talk directly to fans is a, is a, is a great opportunity for us. We're happy to have you here. Thanks. Um, so not too many people, at least fans know, uh, possibly know who you are. I don't know if you can intro kind of uh, who you are and what your role is. Yeah, uh, look, I'm, I, you know, first and foremost, I'm a fan of the game, have been my whole life, played uh, growing up. Um, I've worked for U.S. soccer on two different occasions, like immediately out of school, out of, out of grad school. Uh, worked in communications and, and marketing, and then I left for a number of years. Um, and I've been back in this role for the last 10 years. So currently I'm the chief administrative officer. Um, kind of a little bit of a jack of all trades. Um, we're, we're as, as you know, we talked about, we're in the middle of a CEO transition. Um, so I'm serving in a little bit of a... Um, leadership role until we have a new CEO in place. So it's a, it's a, a bit of a different uh, topic uh, each day. Yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, well, I have some of those topics okay, uh, great. today, by great. the way. Um, a few different, a lot of different uh, questions for you. So okay. hopefully you're ready. Appreciate Fire away. It. Fire um, away. So first, you know, uh, we heard that there's $150 million in current reserves. What what are you guys doing with that money to uh, invest in um, U.S. soccer, the mission, and scouting? Mm, yeah, and scouting in particular. So uh, a couple points. Um, number one, we didn't always have 150-ish million in, in reserve. Um, a, a large part of that um, surplus that we now have came to us as a result of performing really well um, in hosting the 2016 Copa Centenario. Um, and immediately after that event, our board had a retreat where it's, it looked at our um, strategy and really said, okay, we're, we're in good financial health right now, and that's going to give us an opportunity to invest in things that maybe we weren't able to invest in. Um, so the, the plan, we're in the middle of a five-year uh, investment plan which is really set up to um, help spend down uh, in some of those reserves while we're investing in areas that are very important to us. For example, um, high performance, which for us means um, sports science, sports medicine, and, and data and analytics. So we're trying to, um, uh, for lack of a better word, like turbocharge the amount of investment that we can do across the national team landscape and sort of youth development to ensure that we're weaving high performance into our, into our programs. Another example would be coaching education. Um, I, think, I think we all can rally around the idea that having great coaches, in particular at the youngest ages, um, is going to make us stronger as a, as a federation and a soccer playing country. So we're doing a lot of things right now um, and a lot of the investment is related to improving um, access and standards at coaching. And then the, the example you mentioned was scouting and talent ID. <clears throat> That's an area where I feel like we could never invest enough because um, you know, what makes us strong in many ways is the size of our country. And that's also a limiting factor for us because we can't be in all places at once. So we have today a scouting network of about 150, 150 um, um, uh, scouts who work on our behalf and they're going wherever the talent is. So it could be um, our own programming through the Development Academy or it could be other programming. And in some cases it's even unaffiliated. So you think about um, um, ethnic leagues, um, underserved communities, where we're all we're constantly trying to put our scouts in the place where they can find talent wherever it is. So the next question on 
uh, venue selection. So there's a lot of, you know, people always for, ask. For national teams. For national okay. teams, yes, yeah. yes. So, um, so venue selection has been an important subject lately. So could you explain the process for selecting a venue for match and the plan to expand where national teams play and bring, bring in new fans? Yeah, no, that, that, that is really important to us. Um, and in fact, so much so that we put a lot of time and thought into how we're picking venues for our men's and women's team to play. Um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, there's a lot of variables that go into that. Number one, most importantly, is, is the match a friendly or is it a, a match where we, we need a competitive advantage, like a World Cup qualifier, for example. So understanding the, the needs of the game is important. Um, and that also leads very closely to what what are the desires of the coach? Does the coach want to play against a very difficult opponent in a in a in a in a big stadium, or against a, you know a more moderate opponent in a smaller stadium? So, coaches' um, influence comes into play when we're selecting venues, um, as do things like environmental factors. Um, what's the what time of the year is the game taking place? Is it is it a game that's being that's going to take place in February or March where we're limited? with the number of warm weather locations we can pick? Or is it um, taking place in the summer where you might want to avoid you know, Phoenix, for example? So understanding like the needs and the timing are, are certainly important. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is we don't, you know, like many countries have a national stadium where they control scheduling for. We don't have that. So we are always a visitor in where, whatever location we're playing in. So we have to work with um, municipalities, stadium owners, in some cases clubs, um, to find stadiums that, that meet all of those objectives and are available. So th there's a lot that goes into venue selection. Maybe the last point I would make is we feel very good about how successful we have been, especially recently, on, on moving the teams around. So in the last two years, for example, our, our women's team have played um, 28 matches in the U.S. that we were in control of, and those matches have taken place in 25 different unique locations. So we've really moved the women's team around. And similar on the men's side, in 17 men's national team matches that we controlled, we moved, uh, we played the, the matches in 14 different locations. So the goal there, of course, is to put um, our teams in front of our fans across the country and and we do the very best we can with all those other variables I, I, I talked about to, to try to make that happen. So what about matches abroad? Are we looking to do more matches abroad for men's and women's teams um, with opponents that maybe we're not used to uh, yeah. historically playing? Yeah, I think uh, that that's you know the first instance the first thing that I think about there is What's the direction that the coach wants to go there? So um, is it important for us to play against a specific opponent, opponent and to do it in an away basis? Um, and the answer almost certainly is yes. There needs to be balance there between the number of games that we host and the number of games that we're visitors for and, 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 and playing as the away team. So I think there's a balance there. Um, certainly one thing that we think about is um, you know, our fans want to see our team live. So the more home games that we can play, the better. The better for our fans to be able to see it. Um, the more likely it is going to be in a TV window where our fans can enjoy it. Um, so certainly we really like playing games at home. And, and, and fortunately, there's a lot of countries that want to come to the US and play us mm -hmm. here. Uh, but playing away games, um, in fact, I think we just announced the first of two men's away games in the March window. Those games are really important for the development of team and chemistry. One thing that has been a huge subject has been the possibly the lack of diversity in U.S. soccer from the governance to the player pool. Um, what steps are being taken to increase diversity and create opportunities of people of color in inner cities and at all levels of the federation? Yeah, the that, that's a critically important to us. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time and emphasis um, from the strategic side, from the board side, even from our full-time staff, trying to make sure that we're bringing diversity into our sport. Um, I think we can all agree, like historically, uh, soccer it has been a, um, a very suburban, 
middle to upper income sport. Um, but if you look at our teams today, if you look at our national teams today, if you look across MLS today, and even in, in um, a lot of youth environments, there's a, there's a lot of diversity on the field. Um, you know, our national teams, um, from the senior men and the senior women down to our youth teams, highly diverse. Um, in fact, I, I once said to, to a colleague like this, the team photo for this team looks like America. There's a, just a, a lot of diversity there. Um, that is not by accident. Uh, we, have, we have tried to ensure that we're searching for players, that our, that our programs are um, reaching diverse communities, um, and, and even to our association, to the governing body, like, you know, great, great, um, great statistic. Now we have the first ever female vice president, Cindy Parlo Cohn, former national team player. Um, prior to a year ago, we had never had a female vice president. So that's a really good sign. Um, at, the, at our organization level, um, two years ago, we hired a chief talent and inclusion officer, Tanya Wallach. Um, her mandate, among many, is to ensure that we're bringing more diverse candidates to the organization. And we've done a good job there. Um, there's room to improve, um, as uh, I think many organizations would say. Um, but we're really, we're really trying. Like we track um, our statistics in terms of how our hiring practices are going and, and um, how many candidate, diverse candidates we're looking at. We're constantly trying to improve our standards to make sure that our federation um, is diverse. And, and today, we have a, um, a senior staff of seven. Um, and of the, sen of the seven senior staff, we have four men and three women and, and um, diversity within that group. So we're really, uh, we're really happy with that, um, pushing that down to our member associations, so the 110 different members that make up U.S. soccer. That's a little bit harder. Um, however, we have, we have uh, within our youth task force, we have a working group related to diversity and inclusion. And one of the things that that group has come back with is um, it's, it's pretty clear throughout our membership that, that our member organizations want us to help lead and create educational programming on best practices around hiring um, for uh, diverse candidates and bringing more diversity into the organization. So we view all of those things in aggregate as, a, as really positive steps to ensure that U.S. soccer and these organizations that are members of ours are doing their very best at trying to um, build organizations that look like the rest of America. Sure. So what would you say to um, uh, Hispanic fans that would say that they feel they're not valued or communicated to? Well, I, I, would, I would empathize with them first and foremost um, because I'm, I'm I, I wouldn't want to minimize the experience um, a fan has. What I will say is we are taking um, a lot of actions to improve how we speak with fans and members and other stakeholders groups. Um, so for example, creating content and programming through our learning center that is Spanish language. Um, hosting coaching education courses um, entirely in Spanish. Um, these are, those are two examples of ways that we can um, reduce barriers and make um, our programming and content feel more welcoming to, let's say, native Spanish-speaking uh, fans and, and members. So there, there is work that, that needs to be done there. This is not something that will try to solve in one year and have it finished. Um, you know, we're coming into a census year, so I think we'll see a lot of, um, a, a, in, in the next year, we'll see data on how our population is continuing to change. Um, we keep close tabs on that, and we recognize that um, this is the U.S. Soccer Federation, and that includes um, everyone in this country who wants to support us and our teams and our sport. So we are as inclusive as we possibly can. So I talked to uh, 
you know, there's always a topic about, um, you know, the coaches being here in Chicago and I already, already talked to him about that. But uh, part of that is, um, you know, we heard that, you know, we're in the U.S. soccer house here yeah. and uh, you guys might be outgrowing this. I, I heard something about it moving. Uh, are you guys sticking around in Chicago in a new building and move in? You're looking at going elsewhere in the country as well, too, or what's what's that? Yeah, so this is a two-part plan, um, and, and you were at our board meeting, so you, you probably heard a little bit uh, more about this, um, and our staff are aware. We are, you know, we're in these beautiful, you know, Victorian-style mansions um, that made a lot of sense to us as we were preparing to host the 94 World Cup, which is, you know, we've, we moved into these buildings in 91. Um, and they're they're beautiful and um, and antique and they 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 sh they, they feel uh, very comfortable. On the other hand, um, we're we're a young, dynamic, youthful organization that that we have a lot of employees who are between 25 and 35, um, and having a more high performing workspace is more important. Uh, to that population than having something that's more historic. Um, and we also believe that if, if, if we're going to accomplish our goals of winning and succeeding and, and putting world-class players and coaches and referees on the field and, and delivering on the fans' demand for performance, we need to start with a headquarters office that, that looks more like that. Um, so the short-term solution um, will be for us to leave these buildings, um, sadly, but necessarily, um, into more appropriately sized modern office space. Uh, we're not going to leave Chicago in the short term, so we're going to stay in Chicago um, and find space that's more befitting uh, of what our current needs are. Um, and we will do that for a period of three to six years. Um, Immediately after we transition out of these buildings, we will begin to look at what the long-term plan is. So um, the long-term plan will take time. We need to strategize about that. We need to speak internally with staff and our board and other stakeholders to really get a comprehensive understanding of what the organization needs. Um, um, many federations around the world have a headquarters and a national training center combined. That's quite interesting for us, and we'll have to look at that. Um, we'll also want to be cognizant of the size of our country and being close to transportation hubs, um, being in a place where we can um, recruit uh, and train top talent to work. So there will be a lot of discussion and strategy around where we will be long term. Uh, so I'm not prepared to give any uh, thoughts or suggestions on that, but certainly in the short term, we want to move our staff into a space where there's more space, more high-performing type of environments, where there's a better, greater opportunity to collaborate, um, and an environment that feels like the type that we're trying to set up for our players as well. That was my next question. When there was consideration for a long term that you know there could be a different spot than Chicago that could you know benefit the whole program, you guys did consider that. Yeah, and like, actually. Um, you know, we have a we have 187-ish full-time employees. About 100 of them, 105, work here in Chicago. Most of those 105-ish people that work in Chicago are not from Chicago. Um, anytime we post for a job, whether it's an entry level or senior level, it's an it's a national search. We are getting candidates who want to come and work here, and coming from all parts of the country. So. With that in mind, we don't need to be in Chicago. We could be anywhere. Um, the talent pool that we're um, hiring from is the entire country. So, um, yeah, so I'm very much of the belief that we can, should, and will look at other markets that make sense, um, and we'll see what opportunities exist uh, in, in, as we search for the right fit for this organization for the next 50 years. So this is a common question. Um... What are you doing to expand exposure to the game in inner cities as well as for those who can't afford the pay-to-play model um, that runs youth soccer and their feeling? Yeah, look, that's a, I would love to um, make the game more affordable, especially in the places that can't afford it the most. Um, so there you mean urban, 
low income areas where the game does exist, um, not as robustly as it may in other parts of the country, in other um, markets. So there's, there are some things that we can do, even though um, the, the amount of programming that U.S. soccer runs is actually quite small. We think about our national team program and we run a Boys and Girls Development Academy. Those numbers are you know, about 20,000 total players in a country of 330 million. So our influence has to be in other ways. Um, so for example, we have, um, we have scholarship opportunities for um, elite players who come from low income environments where, so for example, this year, the season that just started in 2019, 2020, we've committed a million dollars, um, a little over a million dollars, largely money that um, we brought in through philanthropic means, so donors. Um, so we put a million plus dollars into scholarships for elite players to help offset the costs that they face to participate. Um, is, that, uh, is that the perfect solution? No, I d the perfect solution would be in an ideal environment you would have a situation where um, players were able to compete regardless of their family's economic situation. Um, that's not the case today, but we are, through the scholarship program, through creating um, opportunities, we have a, a youth task force working group that's looking at um, creating opportunities for lower income competitions. We're trying to bridge the gap so that we're able to introduce the game and to help families in these um, environments access the game more. Another thing I would add to that is um, we're, not, we're not in all places, um, but we do have these 110 member organizations that are spread out geographically across the country. Um, in the last two years, we have been providing grant money back to our members to who, many of whom are interested in starting new programming that can uh, provide opportunities for these urban, um, lower income uh, places. So we are putting cash into a scholarship program and we're putting cash into a grant program, both of which are, are largely um, uh, delivering on needs that we're seeing within, within low income areas. Um, not a perfect solution. There's more that can be done. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to see um, us um, create more opportunities through coaching and through uh, other access points that will allow us to do that even more in the future. There's some feeling and uh, comments that the Federation feels closed and limited. Um, is there consideration of opening up governance process beyond current stakeholders and like so key decisions and bringing in fans and outside uh, other people into this sort of like uh, yeah. stakeholders and governance. Yeah, no, for, uh, for sure. In fact, we took a great step with that two years ago when we started the Fan Council. So uh, historically, U.S. soccer, as I said, comprised of 110 different member organizations broken up into uh, different councils. So we have uh, today a youth council, which is made up of all of our members that service youth amateur players. We have an adult council um, working with adult, largely amateur players, a professional council servicing, as you would imagine, the professional leagues, um, and an athletes council, which is uh, the constituency that um, supports uh, current and former national team players. Those, uh, and, and as well, an at-large council, which is um, a little bit of a catch-all for a number of smaller organizations that are members of ours. So those five councils uh, historically have been our governance. Two years ago, um, our Congress, our National Council, voted to give fans access to participate in our governance as well, and we started a fan council. Um, as far as I know, that we're the only governing, sport governing body in the U.S. that gives fans an actual vote um, in our governance, so president, vice president, approving um, different bylaws and policies and budgets and things like that. So I'm not aware of another sport governing body in the U.S. that provides fans with that level of opportunity. Um, and at the same time, you know, we want to be 
uh, very transparent with, with fans and we want to be transparent with everyone for that matter. Um, to the extent people want to learn more about kind of how we govern our finances, our, um, what our meetings look like. Um, we have open meetings, so um, our, our, all of our board meetings are open to the public. Um, we, have, we post all of our um, audited financial statements, um, including the one that was just approved a few weeks ago, um, as well as our tax returns. Um, those are all posted on our website. So it's pretty transparent. Um, and I believe, you know, we took a really smart step a couple years ago by allowing fans to come in directly and be a part of our, our governance structure. And, and that will continue. And I think um, the more that we can do to provide those types of opportunities and show that we are very open, um, it'll, be, it'll be better for all. This, this question kind of goes back to that access sort of uh, question. Um, we do have a lot of members who are coaches and referees as, yeah. as well as fans. Most are fans. Um, uh, there's been a lots of difficulty obtaining coaching referee licenses. What steps are being taken to create affordable access to top coaching and referee education? Yeah, I love this question because um, I feel very passionately about um, development of coaches and referees. Um, it's fundamental to our growth as an organization. And as we know, like we all, you know, we all went to school and you know what a great teacher means to a single class of students. And so multiply that over, you know, a teacher's career and literally you're impacting thousands of, of students. I feel the very same way about coaching and refereeing. Um, there, therefore, for us, it was critically important, given the size of the country, to ensure that we can consistent, we could train in a consistent way coaches and referees. Um, therein came the solution, which is now what we call the, the Learning Center. Started out as the Digital Learning Center and was focused mainly on coaches. And today the Learning Center is a platform where coaches and referees, and in the future it may be administrators or other, um, go to, to um, conduct some of, its, some of our entry-level coaching and refereeing program. Um, today we have more than a million unique users in the Learning Center. Um, again, it started, it started with coaching. Um, we now host grassroots um, programming, um, very affordable, lo like low price point, entry-level coaching and referee programs. Um, we're in the process of converting these same courses um, into Spanish language as well. So it will be welcoming um, for uh, those that speak Spanish as a first language. Um, uh, the goal, of course, is to ensure that we're reducing the barriers for coaches and referees to begin in the game. And then the last thing, Justin, I would say is this is also a really important topic that has come out of our youth task force. So we have specific working groups on coaching uh, matters and referee matters. And I participated in a lot of those meetings and calls and I can tell you it, uh, top priority has been to uh, make coaching and refereeing um, educational opportunities more accessible. So um, as an example, we, we just announced one really intelligent outcome and that was the, the working group on coaching advised and recommended that we start changing the way we host some courses. So we're piloting three new coaching courses now. Um, one of them, for example, is a coaching course that is hosted exclusively on weekends. So we've, we realized that um, at the grassroots level, people can't necessarily take time away from work to go into a five-day coaching course. So, the solution there is, let's, well, let's start hosting them only on weekends. We'll have to do it over multiple weekends, but therefore we'll give um, a greater opportunity for coaching candidates who may not be able to leave their day job for five days to go take a course. So that's been a really great outcome, and we anticipate similar, similar outcomes on the refereeing side as well. What, what is being done to get fan base like us engaged in each of U.S. soccer's programs and eliminate the disconnect fans feel exists sometimes between us and the Federation? 
Yeah, so you're talking about like, so fan engagement, like we've got, we've got staff here that that's exactly what they focus on. Um, and I think engagement is, um, is something that has to happen on multiple levels. So there's, we think about fan engagement in multiple ways. Um, for example, we have, this, we have this fan council now that's set up. So we're, you know, on a regular base hearing directly from the leadership of this fan council on things that we can do better. Um, working closely with the American Outlaws, like that's a perfect illustration of how we can engage with fans, understand what the needs and the demands are, especially since they're evolving over time. So we can, we can um, about face or change course in ways that, um, that are more useful to, to the fans. And then communication, like it's fundamental, of course, it may seem, seem obvious. Um, fans want to communicate with us in different ways. So we have, um, you know, we have from everything from, um, you know, a reception line that, that where we take uh, phone calls from people to digital tools and many of them. Um, it seems like we're adding social media channels um, monthly. Um, and they're based on topics that are interesting. So if someone's a really big fan of the women's national team, but really um, less so about our youth programming or the men's team, there's a social channel, multiple social channels just for that. Um, today we have um, recently started a, a new channel on Twitter. It's at US Soccer underscore comms, which is a way for us to start directly speaking with our fans who want to engage with us or, or members of the media. Um, and, you know, as you know, like anytime you, when you're building these tools, um, you have to make sure that they are coordinated and staffed and there's, some, there's a real person on the end. So uh, we have, you know, we have limitations on our own staffing side. So we're trying to really drive the number of people um, that can participate in the, on the engagement side. So whether it's at a match, um, or at one of our annual general meetings, or um, at a fan-focused event, um, uh, or hosting you here at Soccer House, we feel like there's a multitude of ways that we can um, engage with fans on a regular basis. Most importantly, I would say, we, are, we know that um, things are changing. We have to be good listeners. So I think there's some really good <coughs> ways that we're able to listen to fans, whether it's our, our insider program, which is free, um, to taking direct feedback, like all of that in the aggregate, um, from a communications point of view, are, are ways that we can best engage uh, with fans. Yeah, that's uh, that goes. It sort of answered the you know the next question goes right into it. There's that concern or perception of the lack of transparency mm -hmm. of, and that goes into communication of why operational decisions are made or why things are done this way and you know you answered some of that but how do you how do you respond to that of how do we how can you know the federation improve on getting that communication out farther than what you've already mentioned and stuff like that yeah uh, in fairness we we can do better here and we have started to do better in the last couple of years so our board meetings like I said they've always been open I think maybe people didn't know they were open um, so we post the dates and locations for our board meetings. The, the, the agendas are online. The meeting minutes of past board meetings are online. So that's from a, like a high level, like a governance point of view. Um, uh, and I think we, you know, like we strive to be as transparent as possible. So like conducting an interview like this, um, we, we enjoy this. Um, I, in fact, I think I, I wouldn't be the only one in the room to say like, we're happy to do this more often too. Um, speaking individually with one fan or another fan, like there's limitations to the amount you could do, but doing something here where you're able to speak to a large fan base in one fell swoop and, and, and help answer questions that are important on the day, like we really enjoy doing that and we'll continue to do that. What What's being done to get the best possible people in roles in the Federation? That's from like the coaches, some of the vacancies in the youth uh, teams as well too, and just throughout the whole uh, Federation. Yeah, this is like a personal passion of mine because we are a growing organization. So our year over year budgets are increasing. Our headcount is increasing. 
um, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's essential that we do a really good job um, recruiting, hiring, and onboard, onboarding like top talent. So for me, there's not much more important than we're doing today than ensuring that the people coming into this organization are the best possible candidates we can find and that the people who are already here feel engaged, feel like they're growing and learning and developing in their own careers. So that's, that's really important. Like I told you, said earlier, we hired two years ago a chief talent and inclusion officer. Um, Tanya Wallach is very aligned with um, creating this strategy to ensure that we're hiring top talent and coming and bringing them into the organization. Um, Ernie Stewart has a big task ahead of him um, to um, build out the technical side, which I think is probably a little bit more fan-facing than you know our accounting department, for example. Um, people want to know who the next coach is going to be and, and how we're building out those programs. Um, and it's no different on the technical side. Um, we want to hire the best coaches we can find um, and bring them into this organization and give them a platform where they can be successful. Um, and th there are challenges that go with that. You know, we have we have to make sure that um, we have to make sure that we're appropriately, um, you know, we're creating compensation models that are competitive, that we're um, creating programming that 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 coaches are really interested in. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in working for the crest, whether it's on the technical side or on the administrative side, but then like finding the right people who have the passion to go beyond um, just what it says in their job description, to, to go beyond um, just creating player opportunities, to, the, to, to finding like um, elite talent wherever it is, elite um, um, uh, administrative staff wherever it is, to come in and be a part of this organization where um, we're, we're pulling in, in one direction and ultimately winning World Cups and World Championships. Like that, that is the ultimate uh, measurement of success. Um, so as we continue to add staff, we want to make sure that we're doing it um, with the best possible um, drive we can. Yeah, and speaking of like finding talent, you know, I, I go back to that scouting. There was, there's, there's always these questions about, you know, what's the process of, what's the best way to do, to find and find that talent for our teams. And I'd be curious on what the uh, advancements of that process yeah. are. Well, we have a, we have a talent department. Um, we have, uh, and it covers both boys and girls. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have you know, 150 network scouts who are operating on our behalf. Um, and we have some full-time scouts that are that are spread out around the country as well. Um, we host, you know, t scouting is um, there's some science to it as well. Like it's not just go out and watch a game and write down who you think the best player is. Um, you have to have some consistency in how it's done, because if you put ten if you put ten random people out and ask them to watch the same soccer game, they might see 10 different things. So we've made a conscious effort to create um, a, a talent scout license, which is our way to standardize how scouts are looking at the game. What language are they using? They should be using the same t terminology um, to ensure that when, we're, when we are out scouting games, again, across a giant country where there's literally tens of thousands of games going on on a weekend, we're at least doing it in a consistent way so that as the feedback is coming from the field, we're able to measure uh, those scouting reports against something that's consistent. So our talent scout license has been um, uh, critical to ensuring that we're training scouts to look at the game the same way. Um, and, then, and then like as a next step, is ensuring that we have scouts um, working on our behalf and looking for talent wherever it may be um, across all different kinds of competitions, competitions that we host and competitions that are hosted by our members and even competitions that are hosted by non-members. We don't care where the talent comes from. 
We just want to make sure that it's flowing into the, the pipeline. I appreciate it. I know there's a lot of questions. Um, I appreciate your time, your energy, the time out of your day right before the holidays. Oh, too. this is great. So, uh, I, I hope our members and fans appreciate the information to hopefully answer the questions they have. I'm, I, I hope this is an ongoing sort of conversation as we go because I'm sure there's always questions and people always have questions uh, out there. So again, thank you. My pleasure. Glad to be here. All right. Thanks. Thanks.